This is disc number 11, August 13, 2015. Well, one word I think will describe what we're going to be about today, and that word is attack. And it's attack now. And the reason is that I have the ammunition. I got the state of Utah behind me, everything from the governor, the highway uh, department, and all of the people important, the attorney general, the other sign companies. They're all ready. I'm their spokesman. And so that in itself is a great achievement. But I guess the biggest achievement in a way uh, was the bank. I switched banks from Idaho to Utah. I've been given enough money to keep going, and the bank is collecting enough that they're happy, so everything is good there. Uh, I have Fortune magazine behind me, the article that changed uh, the complexity of Washington, D.C. dramatically. Then out comes uh, the Washington Post article on me, on the editorial page that is worth a fortune in itself. That's there. I have Jack Francis, uh, who if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be in Washington, D.C., and so I can never thank him enough. But uh, above all, I really have Carol behind me, and she's my cheerleader. And she was left here with uh, four children, taking care of them, and if I remember correctly, uh, Mary was just basically just a little over being a baby when I first went back to Washington. So that's uh, behind me. And thinking of Carol, I once kind of wrote a little poem. Uh, I got some inspiration from a, another poem or two. And uh, so between the the two of us, I, I put together a little poem. And the poem, poem says, uh, Carol kissed me when we met while watching the drive-in movie whose heart I was set to get. Say I'm weary, say I'm sad, say that health and wealth have missed me. Say I'm old, yet but add, Carol kissed me. And fundamentally, for the man, that's paramount to receive the adoration and support from his mate, his wife. With that, most men are able to go forth and do their best. Without that, there is frustration. Well, <clears throat> rule number three, and I think this is the most important rule that I learned in Washington, D.C., and it's so fundamentally basic. It's tell the truth. Because if you don't tell the truth, you do not endure with the appropriate reputation you're going to have to have in order to prevail. Particularly in my case, I was all alone. It was just me going back there. I didn't know anyone. So what am I? So tests come along the way, and I think last week when we discussed that uh, Washington Post writing an article, Coleman McCarthy calls Secretary Volpe, who had never met me, and uh, so I'd like you to read this article. And Volpe said to Coleman McCarthy, editorial writer for the Washington Post, whatever Doug Snar tells you, it's the truth. So you don't have to read the article to me. You got the information from him, the article 
is true. What a compliment. I couldn't ask for more. And why the compliment? Reputation. Where did he get it from? Probably from Joe Bosco that I'll be talking to you later about. Number one man that Volpe relied upon. An attorney from Boston. Volpe's from Boston, former governor of Massachusetts three times. He brings Bosco with him. And I had met with Bosco several times. And he took me through the test. So, Volpe backs Bosco because he knows who Bosco is and he can read uh, human beings left and right as good as anybody, and he knew that. Well, <clears throat> in the context of reputation and what I think uh, is valid is a little poem written by Edgar A. Guest. Now, Edgar A. Guest was uh, ridiculed greatly by the so-called sophistry of poets, American poets, as being not, uh, oh, intellectual enough. Edgar A. Guest wrote for the common man. Edgar A. Guest was born in Birmingham, England. His family moved when he was 10 to Detroit. By the time he was 13, he was so smart, he left school and went to work for the Detroit Free Press. He remained there his entire life. Next thing you know, he has columns on a weekly basis, and then he has a column on a monthly basis. And it was really, really something amazing. The c column on the daily ba basis was called uh, Breakfast Table Chat. And these were sent out upwards to around 300 different newspapers across America because people liked him. The common man liked him. He wrote for the common man. And consequently, he made a lot of money. Where the others wrote for the intellectuals, they didn't make as much money and uh, didn't have the support of as broad of uh, viewership as Edgar A. Guest. Well, <clears throat> he wrote this. Men are of two kinds, and he was the kind I'd like to be. Some preach their virtues, and a few express their lives by what they do. That sort was he. No flattering phrase or glibly spoken words of praise won friends for him. He wasn't cheap or shallow. His course ran deep, and it was pure. Not many in a life you find whose deeds outrun their words so far that more than what they seem, they are. There's two kinds of lies, lies as well. The kind you live and the ones you tell. Down through his years, from age to youth, he never acted one untruth. Out in the open air he fought and didn't care what others thought nor what they said about his fight if he believed that he was right. The only deeds he ever hid were acts of kindness that he did. Well, that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be like that, and I knew I had a long ways to go, but I wanted to be that way. So many years ago, 
I memorized Edgar A. Guest's words, and they served me well for all these many, many years. Well, rule number four is pretty much on the tale of three, to tell the truth. But four is rather amazing. I learned this one. Seek out and listen to the right people because you become like the right people and the right people are in the minority, greatly in the minority. My dad used to tell me over and over again, as soon as you're doing what the majority is doing, Doug, you can bank on it. You're doing the wrong thing. And he also taught me, I wouldn't give you 10 cents for a carload of intellectuals. They do not have common sense. They see around things, over things, or under things. They don't see the thing. They miss the mark. Well, that's how I was raised, right or wrong. And, but I think it served me well. Well, one of the things that I did next was I went to Congressman Lawrence Burton, who is from Ogden, introduced myself, told him about Moss's bill. Now, Lawrence Burton is a Republican. Moss is a Democrat. And I asked him if he would introduce into the House of Representatives an identical bill to the word of what Moss had done in the Senate. So now we're working both sides of the aisle, or both houses at the same time. And he agreed to do that. Well, I got to attack. So I got that going now. So I talked to Senator Moss. You know, he was so friendly. He was always, the door was open to me. Uh, I could tell that he, respected me. He knew that I was a Republican and he's a Democrat. We never discussed politics. I've mentioned this before to you. Well, I said, Senator, you have a bill right now, Senate Bill 1442. I would like to have hearings uh, set up with the uh, Senate Public Works Committee on your bill. Is it possible that you could introduce me to Jennings Randolph? Now Jennings Randolph is the chairman of the Senate Public Works Committee. Now that name Randolph goes way back to the Revolutionary War. The name Randolph in West Virginia, where he's from, Wheeling actually, West Virginia, is magic. So he said, Doug, I'll be happy to. I said, but I want you to join. Oh, of course I'll be there. So the meeting was set up. Now in meeting Jennings Randolph, well, by the way, he was a very big man. He was tall, he's big, but extremely affable. A wonderful smile. Uh, you could tell he was carrying a lot of weight on his shoulders. So time was precious. I had, to, I had to streamline what I was going to say and show respect to him. But I had the contract. And I could tell the story, him the story about Utah and what they had done. And how the sign companies had come together, all in support of the Highway Beautification Act. And where did that come from? The Democrat president, Lyndon Baines Johnson as a gift to his wife, Lady Bird, called the Lady Bird Bill. And I really went into that. And we want to support this bill. We believe it'll work. But we have to know where we stand. What are you going to pay for a sign when it comes down? We've got to know this. And I went through it in great detail with him. 
And so we would like you to hold hearings on this bill and uh, where everybody can learn about it. So I think Utah deserves to be rewarded for what it has done. Well, he concurred. But he said to me, uh, I'll do it. But you're going to have to sell the sign companies in West Virginia. And they're going to have to tell me that they want hearings to be held on this bill. He said, now I've, I'm going to instruct my secretary. She'll give you the names of the sign companies, give you their phone numbers, and going to give you their address. Good luck. So now the burden was back on me. I'd never been to West Virginia. <laughs> and all I knew is that they have pretty good up the, at their university playing football, had a reputation even way back that far. And, uh, but I have found from my experience that I'm not able to do too much on the phone. If it's important, I say you gotta meet with them, belly to belly and eyeball to eyeball. So you can read their body English, their reaction, you can shift gears, and you can then have a better chance of coming to some degree of commonality. So, I arranged an appointment. One guy, he says, I'll bring all the other sign companies. But what I say is what they do anyway. I am in charge. I got the biggest sign company uh, in West Virginia. It's me. Well, what happened was that on Memorial Day, 1969, I was in an airplane by myself flying from Washington to Wheeling, West Virginia, uh, actually to Pittsburgh. There I rented a car and drove it down to Wheeling, West Virginia and met with him. I, I can see him now. Had a big house, a very large yard, a lot of grass, a lot of trees. He was dressed very, very casually. But what's my pitch going to be? And so I figured I'm going to just tell him what's happened. And that what's happened has changed everything with me and the rest of the sign companies in Utah because they know where they stand. What do they want to know about more than any single thing? Simple. If a sign comes down, what are they going to be paid for the sign? It all boils down to dollars and cents every time. That's all government is, is, is money. That's how the pie is divided. So that was my pitch. And I said, most people think that there never will be a law passed. I'm going to do everything I can to get one passed, but I'm just one person. I'm just from the little state of Utah, for crying out loud. And there are just 13 of us in this little coalition that we have. I know that my chances are like one out of a thousand, but I'm going to give it my best, but I've made some progress. So I she got to see the articles, and I said, isn't it wonderful that your senator would be willing to even consider hearings? And isn't it wonderful that he respected you so much that he asked me to see you to get your feedback because he wanted you to be happy? And he says, you know, you've remade made me think. At first, I wasn't going to even give you the time of day hardly. But I'm sold. I'll let the senator know that we would like to have hearings held. We don't intend to testify at the hearings, but we are in favor of hearings being held. I said, let's send a telegram now. 
now. Today, I've come all this way. When you add up 2,500 miles from Salt Lake to Washington, D.C., plus the airplane flight to Pittsburgh, plus rent a car to come to you, all I'm asking is, if you agree, let's send the telegram now. Philip <laughs> scored me on this one. And he said, okay. So we sent the telegram. Now, in addition to that, Randolph called John C. Klusinski, who is the representative in the House of Representatives from Chicago, area that was more low-income area in Chicago, that asking them if the House would hold hearings also on the uh, bill, Senate Bill 1442. Well, he uh, had mentioned that there was a similar bill passed, uh, I mean, uh, uh, entered into the hopper by uh, uh, Lawrence Burton. And Klusinski said he would. So it dawned on me, now we got hearings going to be held in the House, and hearings held in the Senate. Now, I was fully aware that these two on this issue of roads, anything incidental to it, the House generally would prevail. What happens when you have a bill passed and the House passes a similar bill and the Senate passes a similar bill, they're never really the same word by word, very, very rarely. So they have to meet at the end of the year in conference, they call it conference. Now the conferees is not open to the public. The House would have so many conferees and the Senate would have so many conferees. The difference is this, because the House has so many more uh, congressmen, they can spend more time on their uh, 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 committee assignments because they're not on as many committees. They gotta spread it around. So therefore they can spend more time, therefore they can get into things more deeply. And so when the conferees use, meet usually on a lot of these issues, the House in many cases, if not most cases, wins because the conferees in the House are more prepared and educated and can do a better job. And the Senate, because they have the biggest egos, they all want to say things. The Senate conferees, well, that's stupid. The House said we're going to have one spokesman so that we don't get mixed up. We can't be divided. And if they uh, disagree with what's going on, all they got to do is just uh, recess and then in private meet, sort it out, and the spokesman comes back and does the talking. And so they always have the advantage as a general, general case. I'm speaking now from experience. So I was concerned about this. Well, so what I did was I had to have more ammunition. I'm only as good as my ammunition. So I came back to Utah. I asked, uh, uh, went down to BYU, arranged to meet with uh, Ernest Wilkinson, he had al I'd already done a big favor for him. I've already gone through that with you on an earlier disc. Told him what was going on. And I said to him that, uh, is it possible that BYU could do an independent study on what the SNAR plan is and analyze the numbers and have premises that you know darn well are relatively accurate and come off with the figure. Like with the figure being how much money would the SNAR plan, which Fortune magazine named SNAR plan, would save the nation uh, by having it implemented. And uh, now what Wilkinson did here was rather remarkable to me. Now, earlier on, Wilkinson 
had decided to run for the Senate, and he ran against Ted Moss. He was way ahead in the polls, but when the election took place, Wilkinson lost. Now what won for Moss was this wonderful, affable, gentle, sweet, mellifluous personality that he had. Wilkinson is intense and uh, to the point and uh, more uh, legalistic. Both are attorneys, by the way. And so Moss won on his personality and Wilkinson lost on his personality. <laughs> That's the long and short of it. So now I'm asking a favor. I'm in his office. And he says, when Moss runs this next election, how are you going to vote, Doug? I did not hesitate. I said, President, I'm going to vote for Ted Moss. Wilkinson jumped out of his seat. He doubled up his fist and he slammed his fist on the desk. And it appeared to me it was so hard as if the papers were kind of jumped. He says, we will do the study. You are honest. You can be trusted. He said, I believe in the validity of quid pro quo. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. I got to admit, I went, because <laughs> I didn't know exactly what was going to happen when he leaped out of his seat and smashed his, his fist on, on that desk. So he yelled at his secretary, get Merrill Bateman up to my office immediately. So he came, introduced me to him. And he told him what he wanted him to do. He didn't ask him if he, if, uh, if he would. He said, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go to Washington, D.C. and testify at a, a congressional hearing and also to testify at a senatorial hear hearing on highway beautification. Explained it, and I did. Uh, he asked me to explain it also. And he said, uh, Fortune Magazine, because I had the article right there, had called what uh, Doug's been doing the implementation of the SNAR plan uh, for highway blight. SNAR plan for highway blight. Does it save money or doesn't it? And you've got to have your evidence. Because what you say has to be written down and has to be turned in and goes into the uh, record. So, so it was all set up. And so it was. Well, uh, the House had their hearing first. This was about the best education I probably ever got in Washington, D.C. I had Henry Helen agreeing to come and testify. I had Merrill Bateman agreed to come and testify. I had two sign painters besides myself, I mean, I shouldn't say painters, but sign owners besides myself to come and testify. And then I had myself to testify. And last of all, I had Jack Francis, the appraiser, to explain how these signs were appraised so that all this information would go into the uh, congressional record want it all in there. What happened was I underestimated the power of Minnesota mining and manufacturing. 
3M, which I've referenced before, owned the largest sign company uh, in uh, the United States called National Advertising in every state in the union. Amazing. Worth, that, that company alone was worth millions and millions and millions. Well, they had their uh, lobbyist testify. He went first. The hearing was for two and a half hours. He sat up there for one hour and 40 minutes. That left us 20 minutes. My inexperience, naivety, under, underestimating the opposition cost me that hearing. I don't believe I've ever been so frustrated and mad in my life, hardly. But the old saying, you know, whom the gods destroy, they first make mad. And I had to repeat that endlessly with myself. I wanted to go grab the guy and yank him off. But all those congressmen up there on both sides of the aisle smiled and concurred and concurred. That bought off that uh, committee. Now what the uh, price was, I don't know. It was Walpole who made the statement, first prime minister in England, that every man has his price. So I'm learning a little bit the hard way. And what am I going to do with the 20 minutes? Henry Helland got the full 20 minutes. I didn't utter a word. Sign painters didn't, or sign company owners didn't utter a word. BYU didn't utter a word. But what we were going to say, of course, went into the record, knowing full well that probably in all reality, it's never going to be even looked at. So, but anyway, I knew where I stood. So with that, I immediately go back to the Senate side, let Moss know what has happened. We meet again with Senator, Senate, Senator Jennings Randolph. Told him what had happened and how much money had been spent by these people coming from Utah to testify, who they all were. And that guy took an hour and 40 minutes that could have been said in 20 at the most. He squirmed. You cannot believe how he wasted time with the pause in between the words. He looked around the room. He just drug everything out, just stretched it out. Got into areas that were absolutely unincidental to the purpose of the meeting. The meeting was pursuant to a bill. One bill. And that bill was to remove on a test basis to see whether or not the Highway Beautification Act can work by taking billboards down company by company. It was never addressed. It just went on and on about the environment and how wonderful the environment is and our signs don't interfere with the environment and on and on and on he went. Well, there's two names that I learned besides Kluzinski. One was a man named Dick Sullivan. Dick Sullivan was the most powerful man on that committee. He was the chief counsel of the committee. He was not elected 
by anyone. He was chosen by the chairman of the committee. Dick Sullivan, about 6'4". He was from Brooklyn, New York, Irish, of course. If you see his desk, you have letters just piled up, not opened. The kind of a guy that knew what they said. He's just that instinctive, just that way, with an absolute powerful personality, dominating. He ran the Senate, I mean the, the House, because he always stayed. Congressmen come and congressmen go. He stays. He sticks. He runs the show. He tells the chairmen what to do. He's that kind of a guy. Now then there was Audrey Warren, who is an assistant to the chairmen. You've got the chairman of public works, and then you've got the chairman of the subcommittee of public works, which was Klusinski. Now the chairman was not Klusinski. The chairman was uh, from Baltimore. Klusinski is from uh, the poor district of Chicago. Well, anyway, Audrey Warren was extremely attractive, an attorney, really, really uh, uh, warm and affable, but you know as soon as you turn your back, she'll stick the, the, the dagger in, in, in your back that quick. Totally untrustworthy, in my opinion. Well, I was now promised equal time by the Senate. But I'd like to read an article, Kurt, if you hand that to me. I appreciate that. This is a kind of sums up everything in a way. Time Magazine. I had uh, there were two articles that came out on me on time, both with pictures. This is the first one. This, they first always took a, a stab at me. The Highway, How to Remove Billboards. With his garish ties and gaudy boots, Douglas T. Schnarr, 35, comes on like a big, bad billboard. He is indeed the founder and president of Snar Advertising, Inc., which owns 1,600 outdoor signs. It was more closely to 2,000, but that's all right. In 13 western states. Yet Doug Snar has become a one-man lobby to ban billboards from any rural road built with federal financial help. That's 44,000 of freeway, 44,000 miles of freeway, 220,000 of the federal highway system. Why? First, because the Highway Beautification Act of 1965 commands such a ban, ban and Snar stoutly insists that, quote, when a law is enact, enacted, it ought to be implemented, end of quote. Second, if the law is ever funded, all billboard men who are put out of business by the act will be compensated to the name of three million in Snar's case. Well, in today's money, that would be, uh, in those days, would be at least 30. A fervent capitalist, Snar would like to start again, maybe in restaurants. I'm skipping now. Snar is confident that things will improve. Got to be confident, <laughs> brother. After all, his whole life has been spent meeting challenges, including a childhood stutter, three golden gloves boxing championships in his native Idaho, and a tour as a missionary, a Mormon missionary in Ireland. Parenthesis. Now that was tough. Quote, he roars, parenthesis. Snar got into billboards because his father, a potato farmer, was too poor to send him to college. By designing weirdly shaped signs that visually jolted the, mortar, the uh, motorists, 
He earned his way through two years at Brigham Young University, uh, then snagged a signed contract from Harris Casinos. By 1965, Snar Advertising had moved to Salt Lake City, uh, boasted assets of $3.5 million, annual revenues of 800000 Then the Beautification Act was passed. My heart sank, Snar recalls, and the next day my bank called in a loan. I wrestled and wrestled with what I should do, continues Snar. I finally realized that highway beautification was a fundamental responsibility of every citizen. He moved to persuade other billboard companies in Utah not to fight the act, then helped to get a state compliance law passed. Now he is trying to move the whole country. The big obstacle is bureaucracy. The whole process, Snar saw, could last decades and cost two billion or more. Next and last paragraph or last area, this is the highlighted spellbound senators. He proposed a better way. Each state should merely uh, uh, pay each billboard company to take down its signs as leases expire. I'm skipping here. The SNAR plan could cost some 500 million and offensive billboards would vanish in a few years. Despite its logic, the SNAR plan will not be tested until a bill introduced by Utah Senator Frank Moss is passed to authorize, and they have written 15 million and I believe that the bill was uh, ex, uh, enlarged from five uh, million originally to 15 million by the time the hearings were held for a pilot sign removal project in several states. Snar is lobbying hard for it. Even hardened congressmen find him irresistible. Senate. Before the Senate Subcommittee on Roads last June, he explained his plan and exalted, quote, the inspiration of America, quote. The senators were spellbound. John Sherman Cooper of Kentucky was reportedly on the verge of tears. Last week, the subcommittee approved the Moss Bill, which now goes to the floor for the consideration it surely merits. Uh, what happened was that on the Senate side, we ran out of time and I was testifying. John Sherman Cooper turned to Jennings Randolph and said, I think that we should continue this hearing tomorrow. I want to hear everything that Mr. Snar has to say. And Jennings Randolph agreed. So the meeting was extended. And everyone on our side all got to testify. Randolph, made, excuse me, uh, John Sherman Cooper, by the way, there's a highway named after him in Kentucky, and considered that the time when the 10 most powerful senators even though he held no committee chairmanships, but his integrity was intact and people respected his fellow senators, his wisdom and common sense. He's a very impressive man, very highly educated and uh, very, very willing to consider all things. So I really, uh, I really, uh, I really like him, though uh, it worked on the Senate side. Now, how am I going to deal with the House? So what I decided to do was to approach John C. Kluzinski and ask him if he's willing to have lunch with me at the House luncheon room on the House side. 
he agreed to do that. And the reason he agreed to do that, because he said this, Moss is a good Democrat, and I am willing to do that. But in that luncheon, there was Dick Sullivan and Audrey Warren, three against one. If you flip that. And what happened was, it was really quite an amazing thing for me, I can't believe it. Uh, they brought a great big little basket of cornbread, put it right in the middle. Well, I was so excited that I was interested in food, period. Uh, I just wanted to, to, you know, get on with this luncheon. But the purpose was to get the bill out of the committee onto the floor of the House for a vote. That's what I wanted to uh, achieve. Now, a little bit back on Kluzinski. He explained to me, he says, I am a machine politician. My leader is Mayor Daley of Chicago. I do what Mayor Daley tells me to do. Now, the talk about Klusinski that ran around all the lobbyists and everyone around there, his nickname was Clue. And they all said the same thing. Behind, he had a big smile. And he's a big man. He's about as wide as he was tall. Uh, behind, behind that smiling face is an empty head. I remember hearing that, <laughs> brother. So anyway, <laughs> oh, it's something. so what happened was that Audrey Warren, more than anyone, did the talking. I just sat there. So she lectured me and lectured me how the Senate had acted without knowledge, without information. It's a private bill that you're working on just to get you out of debt, and on and on she went, which was really the, the line that national advertising had given them, and that's what she repeated. And she was very, very personal, and she kept at it and kept at it and kept at it. So while she was lecturing, Clue was chomping. I mean, this was unbelievable to me. He ate every single piece of that cornbread without, I mean, every one. <laughs> uh, I didn't want any. I mean, I was just too nervous. And, uh, but she went on and on and on. It finally reached a point that I couldn't stand it any longer. And I yelled back at her. And you think Tom um, Trump was uh, irrespective of women on uh, this first debate. Okay. He was like a saint compared to me. And uh, I really went after her and Sullivan and Clue. I said, what do you want me to do? Just lie down on the floor and die? Is that what you want me to do? Or just to go back to Salt Lake City with my tail between my legs? and quit, or that's what you're asking me to do? I'm not that kind of a person. I guarantee if all three of you were in my shoes, you wouldn't either, unless you were useless and not worth your salt, because I am not going to go back, and I am not going to quit, and you can never get me to go back and never get me to quit. I refuse to because I am right. You're wrong. The bill was passed. I didn't pass the bill. You guys passed that bill. Now you implement what you passed. Let's see some courage here. Let's see some character here. Let's see some guts on your part. Now why don't you do that? I know why you don't. Because National Advertise has, uh, has you in their clutch. You do what they say. And that's not what the public wants. So finally, Clue stopped chomping because there was no more cornbread to chomp on. And uh, yes, we all had food to eat. I didn't take a bite. I just couldn't. I was so worked up I couldn't even consider it. So I says, okay, I'll tell you what you got to do to get that bill 
out of committee onto the floor. Number one, you go to John A. Volpe, Secretary of Transportation, and get him to agree to Moss's bill. Moss is a Democrat, Volpe is a Republican. Nixon's now in the White House, and Johnson's gone. Number two, you get Mayor Daley to approve this bill and call me and tell me what to do. And number three, you get the White House to agree to make that money available to test those billboards in their annual budget. And they all knew that they had me right there. And I said this, I am going to get Volpe. I will go and stand in the doorway that leads to his office and I'll stay there all day, all week, whatever I got to do until he listened to what I've got to say. I am not going to be defeated. Well, Clue looks at me and he says, Audrey, you call Volpe and get a date and a time for Doug to meet with a Volpe. She says, no, I'm not going to do that. You're the one that suggested the idea. I'm not going to call him. You call him. And I couldn't believe here's the secretary saying no to the chairman of the subcommittee on roads, and they're going back and forth arguing, and there I was. Finally, they treated him. See, he was acting like a congressman, not like a pawn, as he's been for years. He measured up for once. And so finally she recapitulated. I will get the date. Then he says, I want you to be in that meeting and you tell me exactly what happens. And she says, can I bring uh, Mr. Sullivan? Please do. There's three right there, with well, two against one right there. The rule number five is you structure the environment so that you have a chance to win. And this was set up for a Friday at 5.15. So I'm the last guy he'll be talking to Friday. So I know I have plenty of time. Well, I knew that all this work and effort, if Volpe doesn't agree, I'm through. I'm finished. I'm defeated. Now, one thing I did promise my bank was I will call you every Friday and tell you what happened the previous week. I'm going to give them the good news. I'm going to give them the bad news. Then I'm going to give them what I'm going to do about it. without fail. So they know exactly what's going on. No surprises. Well, the day came, Friday came. I had arranged a breakfast lunch, or not lunch, a breakfast meal with Joe Bosco, most influential man in Volpe's life, next to his wife. And I went through my story and how important this meeting was and why this makes sense and all the people involved that I'd contacted. Now I must admit here that after this, me this article came out in Fortune and the 
uh, Washington Post, the press were hounding me, hounding me uh, over and over again. Talk to them, talk to them. Articles were appearing all over the country that I knew nothing about. Some I did. I've done my best to collect as much as I can, but I couldn't keep track. Interviews, on and on it went. Radio interviews, I couldn't believe it. People here, put the microphone up. They had a little box right there. I remember this one lady, a little box. And this, this is going into Vermont, for example, <laughs> an interview. And she represents a radio station in Vermont. It's amazing how that worked. Well, when I finished with Joe Bo Bosco, here's what he said. He said, what you have said to me is morally right. It is legally right, and it is politically right. I will tell Volpe that when he meets with you at 5.15 today, he gives you all the time you need. And I thanked him. But this was really win or lose stuff. Well, I got so sick after this breakfast that I went into a bathroom and I vomited. It all came down to one meeting. I did not know who would all be there. But I knew that Volpe would be there, and I knew that Bosco would be there, and I knew that uh, Audrey Warren and Steele, uh, Sullivan, Dick Sullivan would be there. That's all I knew. So I went to my little apartment, and I was shaking, and I, I was, felt like I was just gonna burn right up. And I got into the water and the bathtub, I made it kind of a little bit cool so I could cool down. And then in that little plastic room, everywhere I looked, it was just plastic and ugly as could be. And I didn't want to eat anything. Too uh, excited to eat. I said my prayers over and over again. Because, boy, this win or lose thing was a pretty rough thing to take. And so finally, at five o'clock, Four o'clock, I said, now I got a dress. I had one suit that was a pinstripe, a dark blue. I, I would wear it for just certain occasions. The other times I'd wear purple, I had two purple suits, orange, green. <laughs> but I would save this one for certain occasions. But I always wore cowboy boots. But with that one, they were black, alligator, all the way. And uh, I got dressed, and I made my way. Now his office was as big as this entire house on this floor, easily. That main table was so huge I uh, even bigger than Harris' table that I've referenced before. Now, I was left in an outer area until such time as I'd be invited in. But I observed how that Audrey Warren came in and that Dick Sullivan came in and they went right into the main office. I didn't, I wasn't invited in. Well, they were there first. And finally, I was invited in. Now, I remember him saying, Oh, Audrey, uh, this was John A. Volpe. It is so wonderful to have you here. Would you sit right next to me? And so she pulled her chair right up there, right side by side to Volpe. The desk was bigger than that table. And a uh, gorgeous thing. But he also had his general counsel there. His name was George Washington, Jr., the first black man 
to graduate from the law school of Harvard. He did so with honors. There he was. He also had his assistant was there. He was on the other side of Volpe. And then there was the formidable Frank Turner, who I've referenced. The man who Eisenhower chose to head up and build the interstate system across America. Worked there in the department for over 42 years. The early days it was called the Bureau of Public Roads, but now it's the Department of Transportation. And then there was me. And I was directly across from Volpe. And as he, he introduced me to every person, I happen to know every person except George Washington Jr. and his assistant. But he didn't know that. And then the most amazing thing happened. On his little sound system came on. Secretary, the SST has just passed the House. Now, if you don't know what the SST is, it's the supersonic transport, the plane that goes the speed of sound, or over this, uh, goes faster than the speed of sound, had just passed the House. He jumps up and says, get me President Nixon. So, in a few moments, comes back. Mr. Secretary, the president, is out of his office. You get me Haldeman. Okay. Comes back. Mr. Secretary, Haldeman is out of his office. Then you get me Mr. Ehrlichman. Now, that's the three right there that was, was literally running this, this government. Right there. Those three. Got the president and the two. Haldeman, Ehrlichman. Well, then, he said, came back, Haldeman, Ehrlichman is out of his office. Is there anyone else that I can get for you? He says, no. I do not speak to second stringers. I'll never forget that. <laughs> So I'm learning a little bit how things work <laughs> there. Well, then he went on. He said, you know what's wrong with this doggone government? I was very interested right there. He said, they're all a bunch of damn lawyers. And all they know what to do is to argue and to fight and get nothing done. And he went on and on about this. So I knew I'm, I'm learning something right there all along. But then when he finished, he said, Mr. Snar, the time is yours. It just in a flash, I said to myself, I cannot let anyone else interfere with what I'm saying. I have got to be so strong and so aggressive, and I got it, cannot break up my speed of talking that no one can interject one thought until I have finished speaking. And so I stood up. I doubled up my fist and I went bang on his desk. Bang. Do you know what's wrong with this government? Mr. Secretary, it's those damn lawyers. Then I shifted into it, explained how they were blocking this Highway Beautification Act. So I took his words and how he criticized them and criticized what they were doing with his words, with the Highway Beautification Act, Pursued to the, all we're after is to test it. That's what they want to do with this prototype 
of the SST was to test it. It was to be a pilot project on one airplane. That was what it was. That's all we want to do is to test this. And I took up about 45 minutes. And he sat there. Now, when I finished, Bosco came and got me and led me out. He says, you have just sold the Secretary of Transportation. Now, he reported later what happened. When I left, he says, that Doug Snar reminds me of myself when I was his age. If you criticize me, you're criticizing him. So they were all right then stopped in their tracks. And all they could do was just stare. And he, he had them. Well, that was a miraculous thing in my life. I had nothing planned. I didn't know what I was going to do. I said, it's going to be totally extemporaneous. I just knew I was sick and worried to the death. But I knew that the ball game had changed. The Volpe was on board. And she had to go back and report what Volpe said. And he also told her, I'm behind highway beautification, and I'm behind the Moss Bill 100%. I'll do everything I can in my power to get it enacted into law. So she had to carry that message to uh, Clue. The empty head behind the smiling face. Well, now, the next meeting is the most talked about mayor in the United States. He'd been mayor longer than anybody else by far in the United States. He ran Chicago with an iron fist, Mayor Daley. How am I going to do that? How am I going to even get to him? So I went to Moss. I says, here's my situation. Doug, I'll get the meeting. He got me the meeting. So I flew in. Had this limousine, colossal limousine. Had a great big Polish guy. Really, this looked like, you know, a heavyweight wrestler of some kind. Meet me, but he had a nice, tender way about him. I, I really liked this guy. And he just talked about Mayor Daly the whole way, all the way from the airport to City Hall, how wonderful Mayor Daly was. And I asked him one question. I said, uh, when we get through, do you know the best pizza place in Chicago? Absolutely, I know the best pizza place. I'll take you there. Well, Mayor Daly shook hands, and then he turned me over to his number one guy who has to do with all the legislation and everything that goes on in Congress and also within the uh, Illinois uh, uh, department and, and the parliament. So I laid it out. He says, I see not one thing that would negatively affect Chicago. I'll call him and tell him we approve. Whew. So I got two down, three, one more to go. So I got in the big limousine he says, can I eat pizza with you? And I said, yes. So he took me. I can't, I forgot the name, but it was the best pizza I'd ever had in my life. <laughs> Up to that time, I just couldn't believe how wonderful it was. And because cheese was just piled on really thick. It was really good. If you like cheese, you'll love this pizza. But anyway, and he drove me back. 
I said, gosh, you know, this guy's just a wonderful guy. He just, just after all I've been around and these other people I've been talking to, and I meet a guy that's kind of the real thing, you know. <laughs> if you can talk with kings, huh, nor lose the common touch, as uh, uh, Kipling wrote, well, he had the common touch. But the White House. He stipulated that the White House not only got to prove this, but they got to also, as I mentioned to you, they have to provide in the budget the money in their budget to pay for it, in the budget. This took seven months to try and get in that White House. Now, I went through all kinds of ideas. One idea was I finally wrote a letter. This was a recommended letter. I got the stationery from um, uh, Bosco. Had it all typed up. From Volpe to President Nixon. And where Volpe is saying that we have to have this. We've got to have this. And it's only $15 million. But what happened is, and then I had this letter, and then I waited for him to come to work. And as he came to work, I handed him this letter. I said, this is a letter from you to President Nixon. Hell fires, Doug. Here I am, a cabinet officer and I can't even get in there to see him. He has himself so surrounded that even the, the cabinet officers can't talk to him. We don't even have regular meetings. It's absolutely terrible. I have to take, I can't even get to Harley Ehrlichman and Haldeman, really, except just briefly on the phone. That's all. So they give me a little peep squeak, I'll never forget this, a little pip squeak, yeah, I call it a pip squeak, he was about 27 years of age and got a doctor's degree from Harvard and he doesn't know his ass from a hole in the ground. And that's who I got to talk to. And this is absolutely the most frustrating thing that I've had as a Secretary of Transportation, to deal with that little pip squeak. He doesn't know anything. And I've been the governor of Massachusetts three times. My construction company built this building that we're meeting in. This little pipsqueak, what has he done? And so I got a, I got a lecture. So I finally concluded two things. I said to Bosco, Bosco, why don't we take, instead of having this moss bill all by itself, why don't we just take it, include it, in the federal highway bill that passes every two years and just allocate $15 million for however you want to call it, highway beautification, to pay for signs on a pilot project and not worry about some bill. So what we're going to do is we're going to ride caboose. You've got the train going down the road. Well, we're, we'll be the caboose, but we're hooked to the train. The train's a lot bigger than, you know, some little thing all by itself trying to go down the railroad tracks. I like that idea. I'm going to talk to the secretary about that idea. Well, that battered around for a while. And he agreed to do that. So that in his budget that he sends over to become part of the main budget that comes from the White House, because each department has to make a recommendation, then they lump all that together and that becomes the, the, the federal budget. So he, he lumps it all together. But then I said to myself, you know, Doug, I got to get in that White House somehow. 
So I made my mind up, I'm going to get in that White House. Now there is President Nixon, there is Haldeman, who is his secretary, main secretary, from California, by the way, and, and Ehrlichman, who's from Washington. Ehrlichman handles all policy, Haldeman handles all the people. Anyone to talk to him, anything. What's to be said, everything. He handles all that. So then I said to myself, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start calling to the number four man. And that's a man named Chuck Colson. Chuck, I was able to get this information by digging and digging and digging. Chuck Colson was known as Mr. Dirty Tricks. Colson did things for Nixon, one-on-one. -on -one. He reported directly to Nixon, not to Ehrlichman or Haldeman. And he had all the special projects. So when the Watergate thing broke, he was the man that Nixon used to implement the Watergate program. And Colson ended up in prison. Yeah, this was after my time. But Colson really had the eyes and ears of Nixon. So my idea was call Colson. So I started to call him every hour. Every hour. On the hour. Every hour. I called. I remember this one time I was trying to kill some time, and I walked into this shoe store in Washington. I'll never forget this. And the hour was up, and I says, asked the man if I could use his telephone. I said, I, I'm, I have to make a phone call to the White House. I'm, I'm calling a man named Chuck Colson. Can I use your phone? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Come on back here. Went into his little office, a little office complex there in the shoe store, and I made the phone call. And he answered the phone. Colson did. I said, is there any way that I can see you today or tomorrow? When can I see you? I'll see you midnight, anytime. And he says, well, I haven't been aware of you. There's been so much press on you. I'm aware of you. Come right now. now what I had done to prepare a five-page report on highway beautification, single-spaced. And Kay Danes, that I've referenced to you before, this was typed up in his office at J.C. Penney Company. And between McKay, I mean, between Kay Danes, William K. Danes is the name, uh, K. Danes and I, but he, this was his gift. This is what he's at. He's an attorney. And he could do it better than I could. I couldn't have done this without him. I had the ideas of what had to be in there, but he had the way of being able to integrate that uh, within uh, the, uh, let's say, the, the appropriate manner in which it needs to be displayed to fit the style of Washington, D.C.'s communications back and forth. So I got into his office. What I went through was an education, a real education. <laughs> I went through this guy and that guy and that guy to get through. I laid that draft, that letter out to him. And he took that letter and he read it. Every word on five pages, and I sat there. And he got through, looked up at me, he says, an important document you must read at least twice. So then he went and he reread it a second time, all the way through. And he said this, so simple, so logical. Why didn't we think of this? Was how he answered. 
He says, we will go ahead with this. It might not be in the exact form that you have, but substantively speaking, it will be done as you have written right here. Congratulations. So you can well imagine how I feel about to this day. Chuck Colson just died a year ago. And it touched my heart greatly to have lost that man. I had the White House. Seven months to get it. But I got it. Went back to Clue. Told him what had happened that that money will be appropriated. It wasn't five million, it wasn't 15 million, it was 150 million it was, a pro, was uh, put into the uh, budget. So it was much more than I originally dreamed of. I'm thinking at this time, if I can, of 1776, in the Continental Congress, and uh, the Congress had set up a committee of five to write the Declaration of Independence, and gave them all the time that they would need. Now, of the five, the three that count the most was Benjamin Franklin from Pennsylvania. He was the oldest and most held in the highest esteem. Secondly would be uh, Thomas Jefferson of Virginia, who was by far the richest of any of those uh, assemblymen there. And uh, absolutely brilliant. And number three was John Adams. And then the two other, one from Connecticut and one from New York, they didn't play a major role in the writing of that uh, Declaration of Independence. Adams spoke up when they had their first meeting and says, I nominate that who should write this? Thomas Jefferson. In the first place, he can write better than any of us. This kind of a document. By the way, he was the youngest one of the five. Secondly, he said, he is well liked. He's more popular than I am. And so therefore what he writes has a greater likelihood of being accepted than if, than if I were to write it, for example. The others voted and said and agreed for Jefferson to write it. It was made available on the 1st of July and the debate started. And uh, finally it got down to the 2nd of July and the, and the debate was continuing and the day was very rainy. The problem is that the delegation from New Jersey had not shown up. They had to have all of that delegation there. John Adams got up the first day. He literally carried the day he had never ever spoken so eloquently and so passionately and so logically as he did in support of this Declaration of Independence. Jefferson sat and never said one word, not one word. And then what had happened, that when he finished, towards the end of the day, the New Jersey delegation showed up. The president of the Senate turned to Adams and said, would you please repeat what you have said for that delegation? There's no one can match what you have said. He says, I can't do it. I'm so exhausted. I put everything I had into it. I can't do it. And he says, you've got to do it. And he stood. Now the historians write that he was, if not uh, equal to what he said originally, perhaps better. It was as if the light was around him. It just shined. And it was raining so hard that you could hear the patter of that rain hitting the uh, windows. And that was the only interruption, was the noise from the rain. 
Well, and then it was approved and signed on the fourth day. It had to be copied on the third day for them to sign. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitled them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind require that they should declare, declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these rights, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute a new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its power in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Now this is the first part of the Declaration. Now what follows that are the grievances that the 13 colonies and their inhabitants had against the rule of the British Empire. Well, I could go into a number of aspects here as to why that rule was very reasonable compared with any other country. So what you had, you had Great Britain, you had Spain, you had uh, France, and you had Holland, and you had Portugal. These were the, the, the nations uh, that were uh, exploring the world. Now, of those, the most reasonable was Great Britain. And it probably more than anything else goes to two people. One is Henry II, uh, who was married to Eleanor of Aquitaine, and that gave them the empire of most of France and all of the British Isles, was that marriage. Now, what made that marriage so important is that Henry was positioned with all with that marriage, but then he could take and conquer if he wanted to the rest of uh, Europe. But he didn't. His competition was the church, the Catholic Church. And so he figured how he could compete and elevate his uh, kingship against the Catholic Church was through the court system. So he set up his own court system. Now, that court system was more fair than the Catholic Church uh, was. In this instance, it was Henry II said that a man is innocent until he's proven guilty. In the Catholic Church, a man is guilty until he's proven innocent. So the burden of proof is on the one accusing. And that's the difference. That set England apart, or the, or the British Isles apart, from every other government to this day. It's just a rather amazing. Now, <clears throat> then the last sentence of that Declaration of Independence, to me, is the most humbling. And that reads this, and for the support of this declaration with a firm reliance 
on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortune, and our sacred honor. John Hancock, President, attested Charles Thompson, Secretary, July 4th, 1776.